Can I? I hit my heart here. I forgot to say that. Because I think I'm live, but I'm just sitting here looking at the screen. Okay. Just give me a second here. There we go. Oh, look. Buffy's in the background right away. They might be really kind of crazy today, so. Anyhow. Um, yeah. The topic for this stream is if a borderline or a narcissist ex, or if you're the adult child of a borderline parent or narcissistic parent, and it's really something that isn't changing, they're not waking up, they won't listen to any of your boundaries, etc. Are you holding on or are you letting go? And what does, I don't know what that thing says. Okay. And what does letting go mean, you know, versus holding on? Well, <clears throat> I think I'll just start out here by saying a lot of people are holding on because they're not no contact. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is if you know the relationship is over or with a parent or a person with BPD, NPD in any relationship type where they are not seeking treatment <clears throat> or haven't already sought enough treatment or a lot of treatment and they're just unaware of what they're doing and you're constantly being hurt or you were constantly being hurt. So a lot of people are saying they've gone no contact, which is really incredibly difficult in any and all relationship types. So that's one big thing. And then there is why is that, right? Why is it that so many people are kind of no contact? but not really no contact <clears throat> and just a lot of comments on the channel recently, even and in live streams, people are like, yeah, I have an ex with BPD or whatever the case, but like they keep on texting me or they keep on emailing me or they keep on phoning me. So that means there's avenues of contact open, right? And each person in your own life, you have to decide why is that, right? So you're holding on, are you letting go, or do you think there's somehow to there's somehow a way to do both? Because there really isn't a way to do both. That just makes it all the more difficult and all the more painful. And I guess I should check my sound here just before I go any further. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because it turns out that it's usually a good thing to do. Oh, hey there, Dominic from Croatia. Hey there, Melanie. Hey, Cargirl. How's everybody doing? So I'm going to be disseminating a little bit of info. And what was I going? Oh, yes. Yeah, sound check is what I was going to do. Just really quick, which I have a little way to do at my end. So that's a helpful thing. It's probably okay, but I just need to double check. So I'm going to be... Yeah, it's fine. Okay. So. Um, oh, hi, Rob. Oh, the sound is good. Yes, thank you. Hey, Rob, I'm wearing the hat. After last night, I don't know. What can I say? Tomorrow pretends to be, in my humble opinion, either the biggest shock of our lives if the Toronto Maple Leafs win or, again, massive heartbreak, right? So I guess in the case of Leaf fans, I don't know about you, Rob, but I would say most of us are trying to let go, but holding on. So anyway, with that, I'm going to just get into some information here for a second. And I have a few notes. So, and in the middle of that thumbnail, I have not in action. Because trying to, you know, hold on, trying to let go, but holding on, you know, people are in a place of not in action full action and not doing as much as maybe many people need to do so i just wanted to give a little let me see what i got in my notes here so sometimes people can't <clears throat> in certain relationships like a parent of an adult child with bpd and often that full stop or and or when there are grandchildren involved etc People can't just go no contact. Sometimes the adult child of a narcissist or borderline will feel for a lot of reasons they can't either. You have to think about what are those reasons though versus what are you going through. So let me just start out by saying if you are someone 
in an you know you're trying to survive an ongoing abusive relationship with a borderline or a narcissist or combination thereof and or something else it's really important to learn emotional detachment to get into neutrality and this needs to be practiced i help clients with this and explain it much more in sessions with people but you need to get emotionally detached from any abuser in any abusive relationship and it's very difficult because none of this is easy and it's all very compelling so lots of people still believe or very much feel that they are in love with a borderline ex a narcissist ex and very much caring about a borderline or narcissistic parent right and so um, you need to develop this neutrality that really is an emotional indifference in detaching from an abuser even and this is for people that have like not all people with bpd are abusive lots have had some treatment etc but when they are still abusive and, and or narcissists this is what this is about so you get to this hopefully emotionally detached place of indifference and even when there are still this consistent source of pain so it seems antithetical but it is sort of finding the richness of paradox in managing something and then it takes a lot of different strategies coping mechanisms coping tools to manage this emotional detachment whether you are full no contact half and half or still having to be or choosing or not sure what to do so you're still around the abuser Learning to detach is so vital if you ever hope to regain your health, your happiness, your sanity, and most importantly, really, your sense of self. So it applies to people who've been divorced, broken up, uh, have an abusive spouse, partner, ex-partner, parent, best friend, co-worker. It doesn't matter who it is, right? And I'm not saying that everybody that might be toxic for you is you know going to be a borderline or a narcissist because there's other people too and maybe they're just undiagnosed or maybe they don't fit those labels for what those labels are worth so emotional detachment requires that you change many of your attitudes many of your thoughts beliefs and behaviors and yes it requires grief it requires learning the emotional landscape of yourself much better and, and it involves, you know, not only like I'm always talking about inner child healing, family of origin work, but those two processes in healing and recovery make the process of self-differentiation then possible to do, which is also not short, simple, or easy, but is very worth doing. So when you're detaching from an abuser, you're not enabling them in any way anymore. So that involves some setting up of boundaries. And it's about disarming them by eradicating their ability to hurt you. But that doesn't mean it's not like it's not about changing your beh behavior so that you don't trigger them or set them off or whatever the case. Um, but you need and it's not to to change them either. It's just simply to take care of yourself. So here's a few things that are really important. to Remember, OK, love does not conquer all. And love in these relationships is not healthy love. So there's that too. And so uh, also, you know, you can't fix or rescue someone when they're being abusive or I don't know if they're sick or, you know, some people believe mentally ill or whatever the case. But um, probably having a response to childhood trauma, which is ongoing, if not treated. Um, but if they're dysfunctional they just can't relate healthily to you they aren't respectful etc um they're lost in their highly their own highly distorted reality then when you're trying to rescue someone like that and if they have borderline personality or narcissist or or histrionic um or histrionic personality or a psychopath for that matter it's just like trying to rescue a drowning person who's crying for help in the case of some don't cry for help and then they hold on to you under the water so you're trying to save a drowning person who is drowning 
you. And in this case, I'm speaking emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually. So the more you try to rescue them, the more you, they're dragging you under it all. You have to stop. You have to make a decision. You don't have to. It's healthier for you to make a decision that you're not going to enable or allow the power or the abuse of power of anybody anywhere in your life to hurt you anymore. You can survive and thrive without an abusive relationship, but you might not know how to yet. Depends. Very highly individual, a lot of variables there. Some people are addicted to chaos and drama and conflict because maybe that's how you grew up as well in your family of origin. Many people don't need the, you don't need the person. And you had a life before them, unless it's, you know, a parent. Um, and eventually you'll do much better post, you know, the borderline, the narcissist, the psychopath, whatever. So, you know, the person with BPD or NP or whatever is not your responsibility. And their happiness is not your responsibility. And whether how they feel about you or what they think about you is not your responsibility. Their failures and shortcomings and their bad behaviors, not your responsibility. The fact that these relationships don't work out, and even when you're the adult child, not your fault. Many people get into the fog, the fear, obligation, guilt, and feeling, yeah, feeling really guilty. And this comes from shame wounds, you know, so, and I can see comments are happening, so I'm going to get to you soon. But continuing to hope for the best with someone with BPD who's untreated especially or a narcissist or beyond, it becomes more than pain. It sets up really this massive disillusionment, but something that can keep people drawn in. And I'm going to talk about why is it that people are still stuck and blocked and drawn into this? Because there's many reasons. So you have to know, even if you don't feel like it right now, you're not helpless, you're not powerless, and you're not incompetent. But I will say that a lot of people feel those three things and more and may have learned helplessness. If you've had a borderline parent or a narcissist parent or both, or like I had a BPD and PD mother with the, with the dark triad father, right? Well, in my family of origin in my childhood, I didn't learn anything I needed to learn. I, I merely was busy surviving. And when that's the case in your childhood, or for people with codependency, less so the case, but about emotional safety often, then we just don't learn what we really need to do to take care of ourselves. And we don't learn what love is. Oh, no, no. We think love is something to fight for. And it's not. So there's no shame in admitting that you need to walk away from a relationship that's destructive and toxic. So it's really important that you begin to develop a rational perspective and distance yourself from an ongoing hurtful relationship that you can't change. So just a few other things quickly here. Some detachment techniques, right? Which can be useful whether or not you're still in contact or you're still in the, re the relationship or it's a parent and you don't know what to do. Make yourself solely responsible for your own well-being, peace of mind, de-stressing, and happiness. Catch yourself when you begin to think, if only he or she could, if only he or she would. But, you know, this is my mother or my father and they should love me. And like I'm still lots of people are still invested in trying to get that love from a parent that they haven't been able to get. That's something that you have to also emotional detach, emotionally detach from. And when I keep using the words emotional detachment, yes, grief is a big part at every step of the way with all of these things. And so it, except that you can't fix, change, rescue, save or make anyone else happy, or make them love you, or make them be nice to you, or make them think well of you. Because these are a lot of the traps for people emotionally, mind traps, etc. Eliminate the hooks of your abuser. 
A hook is typically an emotional, psychological, or physical stake that you have in the other person. And you might not understand why you have that right now, right? And then, because it could be in your unconscious and the relationship. And an example is guilt can be a big hook that keeps many people uh, in indestructive, unhealthy, abusive relationships with somebody with BPD, NPD, or histrionic, or whatever the case. And, um, you know, like you're worried about they don't know how to take care of themselves. Well, what, what would they do without me? I'd be so guilty if I left because of the kids, etc. So the flip side of guilt is ego. And if you leave an abusive person, they'll do just fine without you. In most cases, not all with BPD, but they'll probably try to um, suck you dry financially while lining up their next person or narcissist, their next target, um, to abuse. It's not personal, especially if your spouse is BPD, NPD, HPD, ASPD, and or avoidant personality that, that I saw somewhere that I included in my notes. These neurological, biological, well, I don't think they're really, they're not really proven to be neurological or biological disorders. Um, so within BPD, NPD, etc., others are viewed as objects and largely to be used, whether that is conscious or unconscious. Other hooks include shame, you know, a failing or not being strong enough, loss of status. You're not going to be perceived as the nice or the good guy or woman. Loss of material assets. Issues with access to children, which is really important, but not going to be important if you stay in a stressful situation, you get hurt or worse, and you can't function because you're losing yourself. Perfectionism, your own need to control or, or to take care of others in situations and outcomes. So you need to learn how to control your body language in an effort if you're still around the abuser, you need to lower your expectations and your expectations on yourself right now because there's some things people need to get busy doing for themselves, but don't expect that you should be perfect or know everything. And so there's uh, the hypersensitivity or the reactions from emotional predators and bullies, which I'm not saying everybody with BPD is, but narcissists and beyond. The ad person VP can be bullying, um, or a certain percentage. If you stay in the relationship, the best you can expect is exactly more of the same. So if you're out of the relationship and you're no, con you're not no contact or firm no contact, and they hoover and you miss them, and of course you have all the feelings that you have. But this is what I work with clients to understand: Why do you have all those feelings? Because they're not all about the cluster B. They're just not. They go to something in your childhood as well, multi-layered, multi sorry. So happiness, well, first of all, we're talking about peace of mind, psychological well-being, and finding yourself more than happiness, right? But there's a big difference between what you expect versus what you get in life often. We have, so we have to radically accept and adjust to that and then make healthy choices. So if you keep expecting good things to happen, but they never do or take a turn for the worse, then you suffer a lot more pain. Not that you're not already probably had enough pain from whoever this person is in your life with BPD or NPD or more. So it's really important to try to look at a bigger picture than the immediate here and now. So codependency involves love addiction. Codependents rely on another person for their sense of self and identity in a different way and to a different degree than many people with BPD and certainly those who aren't treated. So this affects an individual's ability to have a healthy and mutually fulfilling relationship. Codependency is a learned behavior that is often a result of growing up in a family with codependent relational patterns or if you were... Um, Infant, infantilized or parentified or you had a parent that was somewhat neurotic if not a borderline or a narcissist or maybe had good parents but there were reasons why they weren't emotionally available sometimes and you felt rejected or abandoned or hurt in one way or another to one degree or another and then codependency has its own 
unhealthy, largely often unconscious relational patterns and repetition cycles. So that's just a little bit of information. I could go on and on and stuff, but I'll go on and on in, um, yeah, with, with seeing what people are saying. And um, if people have any questions or generally things to share and things of that nature, just give me a second. I'm trying to move windows around. This is like, you know, it made it a bigger job than it should be. So, um, let me see here. I got to do a lot of backtracking. Um, hopefully some of this dialogue's been between you guys, because there's a lot of it. Okay. Um, oh, um, who said, Craig said, sound high tech, good gain structure. Well, thank you. I don't even know what that means. I just do my best with technology. Um, oh, hey there, GB. And thank you for letting me know the sound was good. Yeah. So I'm back there. Uh, Rav said, uh, that game caused me an adrenaline rush. Yeah, well, I was watching it with my partner and a few friends, and it was just like, we didn't know whether to turn it off, give up, or what. We hung in there for the impossible. Gotta say, that was that was really something. And the only thing I'll say on that, because I don't want to get off topic, is that the Leafs um, should have a, you never know, right, it's the Leafs. But they should have a major psychological advantage and momentum gained by Columbus's collapse. So, but we can't count on that. So there you go. Um, and I love Steve Dangle's um, video after the game. It was just amazing. GB, what a timely video. How does someone detach property? Well, first of all, it's not a matter of, like, when you put the word property on the end of it, it suggests that you think there's a wrong way to do it. You know, so... There are more effective ways, there are the healthiest ways to do it, but I don't think it's like whether or one does it or not properly, it's whether one really follows, makes the decision, makes the choice, and follows process steps to, to really get to detachment, emotional detachment. So I think in that regard, some of the information I gave may be helpful, but let me see, what, how does someone detach? Well, it starts off with you really have to be in tune with yourself, focus on yourself, knowing what you're feeling. So it involves some of that work, right? Which a lot of people, like I help a lot of clients with that. So some people can manage some of that on their own. Some people really getting into a process of working with somebody will help because you need to be aware of what's keeping you stuck from detaching. Then there are coping strategies and skills to learn, tools to build. Everybody needs to increase their emotional intelligence like we all are through the course of life if we've made that choice, right? So detaching is making first a decision, okay? And if you're still around the person or it's a parent or depending on the relationship type, then the emotional detachment, the first decision you have to make is, this is not okay for me and I am not going to put up with this anymore. Then you'd also have to have an assertion to yourself, and I'm not going to worry about what this person thinks of me. I'm not going to woulda, coulda, if only, shoulda, shoulda, shoulda. I've decided now that I need a boundary for myself, and this is all happens within you. You don't say anything to them. I need a boundary within myself to disengage this, at least emotionally, if not physically as well, right? And then if people have left people and their exes, well, then you still need to do this emotional detaching work, even though maybe they're not in your immediate environment, you're, they're not in your immediate environment, whether you are still having some contact or are absolutely no contact. So um, I can't be any more specific here, really, but I'm um, sorry about that. I hope that helps a bit. Hey there, Chelsea. Um... I don't know what the beginning means, but okay. Yes, you caught me again. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, yes, I've had a very good day. Thank you. Um, I hope everybody else has too. Hi there, Elle. How are you doing? Um, Alpha Dog. Hey there. Long time no see. How are you? Car Girl. Yes. Quote, love conquers all. Where did that saying come from? I don't know. Um, somebody who was really a magical thinker, I think. 
He said, Ugh, I'm thinking a philosophical person of the past. Well, I don't know if it was really, yeah, maybe. I don't really know the origin of it, but um, it, it was probably more like some romantic. I hope it wasn't a philosopher. I hope it was more like some lovesick romantic poet or something. Obviously, it was somebody famous who said it for it to last throughout all this time. And Craig said, no, sorry, Rav, um, not a pro sport guy, but this blower makes quick work. Okay, I guess I missed something there, I don't know. Um, oops, I just was in the right spot, and you know me in the scroll bar. <laughs> I don't know. Alpha Dog Elite 3 said, sorry to Chelsea, I don't even understand how you couldn't like your daughter's as a man um oh i must have missed something else there uh let me see oh yes i did okay wait a minute um alpha dog i'll just call you alpha dog is short okay you said i think my problem is the trauma from the relationship was so traumatic yeah that's why they call it trauma and i'm just funny with you a little bit there um it aged me my hair fell out. Oh my God, I'm sorry. So I know I'll never meet anyone else. It's sad because I was doing really well before her. Well, it's not that you won't meet anyone else. It's that you just really need to make sure that you're healed and know yourself really well in the spaces and places that you might not have known yourself prior. But I'm sorry to hear all that you went through for sure. Hopefully you're doing a bit better now. Um, Chelsea, you know, my dad was... Um, real mean to me but i'm no longer angry so much at him i realized he was a victim in his childhood and he didn't learn how to take care well and that's very true but you know and that's something that people can get to but i always recommend with clients and it's true for my own life and lived experience how i got to forgiving my my parents and my family of origin etc um everybody involved in that uh was after i took care of myself after I healed and recovered. So don't rush the forgiveness piece. And yeah, every parent that is abusive, that has BPD, not all parents with BPD are abusive. Some have had treatment. But all parents that are abusive that have BPD or BPD comorbid NPD or like my father was a dark triad uh, and they don't get, well, dark triads can't get any help. But um, we, we know that they had it rough in their childhoods too, but it does not in any way excuse what they did. So people just need to be careful not to put that rationalizing, semi or more forgiving cart before the horse of your healing, so to speak. Um, oh, thank you, car girl. Yeah, you said, hey, let's all give a thumbs up if you haven't. I'd appreciate that very much. Um, Chelsea, and he raised us all alone as a disabled dad and i know he tried so hard to do well but he also doesn't like girls i'm his only daughter and i was also kind of um yeah well you were parentified right kind of mom to your big brother 11 months apart hi c forest how are you uh yeah well yeah and then alpha dog was saying sorry chelsea i don't even understand how you couldn't like your daughters as a man. Well, I had a dark triad father that didn't have an issue with that either. Um, he wanted his son and he got his son and they are often very um, misogynistic uh, and beyond, you know, so they, they hate women. And that largely comes from the mother wound of their childhoods, okay? So, and if that is not dealt with or not healed, then whether it's a um because here's something i like to say to just be a clarification to things i've heard doesn't matter where doesn't matter why but it doesn't work according to gender so for example if you're a, if you're a man now you were a boy and your mother had you know say untreated bpd or was a narcissist or whatever or just wasn't emotionally available for you and you get wounded abandonment wound or worse then when you grow up to be a man it's not like you've got a different woundedness from a, a, a girl who grows up to be a woman 
who has the same, like a same similar wound from a mother or whether the wound is, is from mother and father or whatever the case. So it's not gender specific. It's not just that men will have this woundedness and then some men may um, have some different attitudes towards women. Some women may have some hatred for men, uh, men and women trying to get together in relationships. And so the woundedness to children from mother or father is not different for either gender of child. I just want to make that clear. It, there are some nuances and differences, but it is devastating whether you are whether you were a little boy or a little girl. And um, Chelsea, um, yeah, well, you know, um, you're telling us all about what happened to your father, and that's understandable. And I could go chapter and verse on that too, but what's more important, where you are today, how you're doing, where you're heading, or everything that happened to him. So again, there's a time and a place for forgiveness, but I mean, I don't know where you are in your journey. So, you know, uh, Dominic, um, to help a dog, it's not about the looks. I'm 24 and have much gray hair. What's wrong with gray hair? <laughs> but at 24, maybe that's a little early, right? And skin problems from stress, I guess. But if you work on your values and start to enjoy life again, someone will appreciate that. Well, and you make a really important point, Dominic, because, you know, for people that looks are everything, there's something there from childhood, etc. And I don't know about others, and everybody's different. People can be different at different ages and stages of their life. But what I've always, what I've always been aware, of, yeah, looks matter somewhat, right? But then somebody can find somebody handsome or cute or good looking that other people would go, are you kidding me? It happens. So the thing is, if they're being judgmental, it's really important to get to know the per who's the person inside the body, be it that you rated a seven or a six or a five or a four or a 10, because looks can be for some people outstanding, but they can be some of the hollowest people on the face of the earth. And that gets rather painful. Um, I don't know, Chelsea, I would just say he didn't know how to love you. And, um, you know, I'm not sure your situation, but I know in my own life, in my childhood, uh, neither parent knew how to love me. And in fact, they didn't love me. And in fact, they had hate and contempt. So, um, and not just for me, but for, you know, other, not as much for the golden child, but sometimes he didn't get warm and fuzzies. And the fact is, when you know, it, it's a journey and a process of grief to radically accept if this is the case, right? When a parent doesn't love you because they're incapable of it. I'm not saying I don't know about your situation, but in many people's situation. Well, I don't know, Alpha Dog, at 45, I don't think it's late for you at all. I think that with all due respect, the way you're feeling about that is... A negative core belief right now that is going to limit you for sure. You know what I'm saying? And, um, okay. Okay, everybody's talking to each other. Good, so I can keep moving forward. I wonder if anybody, just really seriously, just wonder if anybody heard anything I said earlier about what well, might be helpful, but you know. Um, Angry Diver. I find this live stream interesting. I've spent, I have ASPD and ADHD, so also not the healthiest partner to have. Well, yeah, well, but you're aware, at least, right? That's, that's a very positive thing. Um, Craig, again, AJ, I, I so appreciate your support for going no contact. BPD is enough by itself. Emotional environments can be let go of. Not only emotional environments, but people can be let go of, too. It's called the grieving process. It's called loss, but it's called radical acceptance of what is. And uh, it's not easy, but it's important. 
And um, what was the rest of your comment there? Sorry, because there's so much in between. Um, hey, off the chair. Uh, other people will probably be okay. Well, you know, we don't want to sound just passionate or unempathic, but whether other people are going to be okay or not is up to them, not up to anyone else. We don't have control over other people. And that's what's at the heart of this for people, believe it or not, is control. And it might not be so much just control of the other person in an adult relationship, significant other relationship. It's a control struggle battle that might have been ongoing since childhood with a parent. But it is about one's need to look at oneself, get into a healing and recovery process, working with someone where you really do that healing work so that you know yourself better, you like and love yourself and learn how to nurture yourself. Because um, otherwise people are trying in all kinds of unconscious ways to get something through other in various, to, to various different degrees. But that's for people with BPD doing that and not in the same way, but similar, people with codependency are also doing that. Um, Wow, I mean, recount, okay, so somebody's recounting the past quite a bit, okay. That's also not going to be helpful to people moving forward, just saying. Um, no, okay, good, good. Who am I talking to here that's listening? <laughs> Somebody, I hope, because everybody else is too ensconced with each other's stuff. That's all right. When it's supportive, it's, it's probably more healthy than when it's something else. And, um, mm -hmm. oh, thank you, Alpha Dog. Thank you so much for that. I'm hanging in there. Thanks. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you very much for the donation. And you did say here that, um, good that you see both sides. I just think children are pretty precious and we should do what we can so they meet their full potential. Absolutely. And of course, many of us know, and many children today are not living the kind of lives being supported in the ways they deserve to, to be able to reach that full potential without some kind of pain, maybe a little bit of help and therapy along the way and processing. And, um, Alpha Dog, um, thanks, but it's been years. I think, um, a switch got flipped. I focus mostly on work now, which begs the question, why am I working so hard? Mm. Well, you know, and it sounds up a dog like, you know, like maybe you're unconsciously very in a protective place with what sound like negative core beliefs. And why would I say that? Because you are making choices that might be a little more unconscious. And I can just tell that from what you're saying. I don't want to read too much in, but um whatever we really want to change whatever person want and and maybe you're not wanting to do that right now then that's your choice but if you want to change where you're at in your life you really can but unfortunately these things don't happen without pain and without grief and are you holding on or are you letting go because it's really important to get into a process of making choices working with someone doing the grieving, do, uh, learning new coping skills and tools and looking at negative core beliefs, reframing them, where are they coming from, so that one can free oneself to find a new way forward, if that's what, what one wants to do. Um, angry driver, can't forgive either. I am a revenge addict. Well, I think lots of people, for lots of different reasons, get into re punishment and revenge. But hating people or punishing or trying to seek revenge on people, uh, there's never a justification for that. And that actually, in more cases than not, hurts the person with the vindictive nature or the feeling so wrong that or the you know, wanting punishment, wanting revenge, or hating, um, that hurts the person more than the person that they're hating. 
So as long as once we know, and I know, my family of origin, and just the work I do here online, oh, there are people that hate me. Oh, wow, so what? I don't care. It's their business. What people think of me is none of my business. That's something that everybody should say to themselves. And then start living it. It's so freeing. And that's really on the letting go side of the ledger. It's not on the holding on side of the ledger, so to speak. <laughs> okay, so when it's quiet, I'm just looking. Um, Alpha Dog, solid point about radical acceptance. Well, it, you know, you're welcome, and it really does work. It has to be practiced. It doesn't happen overnight, but wow. You know, radical acceptance is a gateway to change. So first the radical acceptance practice, and then you'd be surprised where you can go from there because that's getting radical acceptance is about not saying that what happened or where you're at or what you're thinking or how you're feeling right now is horrible or that something else would be so much better. It's about really just accepting what is or what was as it was, what is as it is, without putting good or bad to it. It's, it, it, it's a very nice, detached, neutral place from which to understand where one's at, what you've been through, and where what one wants to go, which are all choices that await people's letting go instead of holding on right letting go to to radically accept many other things and to be able to keep moving forward and cb thank you your explanation uh, was very helpful i've gone no i've gone to no contact or sorry i've gone no contact but i'm recently thinking about my ex a lot feels addictive um it is addictive right it is it is an addiction that needs to be it's like it's from the trauma bond right got to break the trauma bond and part of that is really breaking the addiction because these relationships do a lot of damage to people and you said time for sure um oh sorry i, I can usually read but all i can't see from here time for some therapy i think yes i think that would really be helpful to you for sure and you deserve that and um Wow, that just did something strange. Okay. Um, where was I? Um, yeah, Chelsea, and that makes sense. You know you never deserve what you got. Buffy, don't interrupt the computer. Get off, girl. Get off! From either parent. But, or uh, either your parents, but you understand their point of view doesn't make what they did excusable. Well, I understand their point of view is kind of irrelevant, I think, until one heals. And then, yeah, that's a good thing. It's a positive thing. As long as it doesn't keep anybody blocked from the change and healing that they need to do and that they deserve to do. Oh, I keep disappearing under this camera. Okay, so... um Uh, people have to improve inside themselves at first to be able to improve anything in society or look outward or think about the next generation. Although some people have kids before they get through that process and it becomes a rather immediate concern. DB, hi AJ. I was interest, it, um, it was interesting what you said about the grieving process being part of radical acceptance. Never heard of it put this way before. Well, I'm glad that was helpful. And um, Chelsea said, these videos have helped me understand myself so much. Well, I'm really glad. That's fantastic. An angry driver. Um, how important would you say it is to be there for the child around the age of zero to five as a father? It's equally, well, I mean, okay, so maybe not equally, but it is extremely important too. So mother, if mother is, you know, has a child and is a main caregiver, that is something that is so crucial, but so is dad, right? So it's kind of mother first in the beginning of life for every child, but dad is really important too. And I think it's really important that fathers are around and engaged uh, with their children between especially zero to five years of age. 
Um, so, because dads are important too. I don't want to minimize that at all. And then you said, I could not imagine myself being able to take my time um, to spend it with the baby. I can't stand these um, age ranges, but I wonder how important it is for the child development. Well, it's really important for the child development. It is really important. Um, and, you know, as we progressed in society, many men do a lot for their infants. Many men spend a lot of time with their infants, just like mother might be main caregiver, mother might be breastfeeding. Well, no, men can't do that. But many men are just as involved, really, with infants as are the mothers. When you know, And, and that's the ideal, really. And of a dog, I think um, it's vital that the child have their parents' love between zero to five. Yes, it is vital. It lays a foundation for life going forward where people have either gotten to a healthy place like, and they got through the early stages of childhood development relatively unscathed. Nobody's perfect. No parent is perfect. That makes for an emotional foundation of mental health. And anything short of that means different things for different people, but definitely means therapy is going to need to be in their future, or they might make a series of self-sabotaging, self-harming, not just people with BPD, kind of choices because, because shame wounds and abandonment wounds. Um, so yeah, a lot can happen. I mean, it, it, so much of the trauma that affects people in their adulthood comes from the ages of zero to five or zero up to six really but after that too things can really impact people it just won't usually result in a personality disorder and rav said revenge um will do nothing for anyone and it will only hurt yourself you only hurt yourself in the process can you believe i saw a video on youtube and a so-called expert was giving advice on revenge against a narcissist I think many people out there are giving um, that kind of information, and I guess that's their lens, and that's what they see, and that's what they believe, but yeah, I can believe it, Rob, and um, you know, I mean, I never sought revenge on my family of origin or the parents. Um, I had revenge fantasies many, many years ago. I don't anymore, and I forgave them, and it was hard work. It hurt a lot. And actually, I, I got to voice that to my mother, though she was not interested. But I never did get to, and, and we don't always have to voice it to them. But, you know, my father died a long time ago, and I actually didn't get through forgiving him until 10 years after he was dead already. But it's important spiritually, I mean, emotionally and psychologically for me, you know, for my health overall. But I also feel like there's a spiritual connection to my father now that is most puzzling because it's rather positive <laughs> so you know who knows what that's about and alpha dog radical acceptance is a gateway to change got um got it yeah and that's actually something that i said i'm not saying it's new under the sun but i wrote an article it's on several of my blogs about that um that radical acceptance is the pathway and or gateway toward change so selfhelp.one.ca borderlinepersonality.typepad.com, hamahari.ca, probably on those sites. But so if, if, you, if you're interested in reading that article, which is free out there, blog, whatever it's called today, you can just Google radical acceptance is a gateway or pathway to change. Put my name behind it and you'll find it if you're interested. Um, angry driver, then back for it. I will pay them back uh, even after years. Well, that's, you know, I mean, people make their own choices and decisions, right? But that, uh, and I'm not sure if you're the one that said you had ASB or not, but um, that might m give you a different lens. I don't know. But for most people, there is like a, um, to the revenge, to the punishment, even years later or whenever, there will be a backlash to a person as well, one way or another. Well, thank you so much, Deborah. I really appreciate your donation, too. Donations are wonderful. Thank you so very much. Um, and I don't want to equate it with money, but it's very nice to get unexpected gifts and donations because it just inspires me to want to do more here, work harder. And so, you know, kind of like it's just a sometimes a little bit of give and a little, you know, whatever. But, but thank you so much. 
and um car girl aj i've been trying to remember that others opinions are none of my business really working on that well and like anything and everything that is change or create you know someone is creating in their life i remember when i was creating that change um it, it's a process and it takes time and then once we get there it's not like it's perfect but we can always remind ourselves of it much more quickly without having to worry what somebody else thinks about us or whatever so that's the real positive thing and once you get that you know solidified within yourself which takes time then that you'll never lose that and many other things and changes that people make yeah you should write that one down help a dog yes um chelsea i have the best husband he was always until February this year. Um, yeah, because of the, you're separated right now. I mean, not separated in your um, relationship, but by distance. Um, oh, yeah, he always helped around the house and with the girls. That's great. Yeah. Well, I really hope that you guys get reunited really soon. Thank you, driver. I see. I got, I got to work on myself a lot more regarding that. Just hoping... To never get an accidental child. I'm nowhere close to ready to be respons a responsible father. Well, yeah, then you have to take those precautions, right? Or whether or not you think you ever want to be a father, there's more you could do on your side, right? Depending. Um, Elpa Dog, um, how do we forgive? Buffy, get off. I tried to play stuff over in my head. Oh, I tend to play stuff over in my head, sorry. I don't want revenge, but the past still bothers me sometimes. Well, I think before people can realize or come to um, wanting to forgive, you first have to heal what still hurts, right? So with what, what some of what you said earlier would suggest that there's still some things you need to heal in, in that it didn't suggest you're feeling wonderful about yourself, right? That they, or parts of yourself that you don't feel so positive about um you know like maybe it's too late for you or you're not going to date again or those kinds of things so people need to do their own healing and recovery work first and then secondarily and or sometimes along in that process simultaneously then people can start working on forgiveness because really it's hard to forgive people that hurt you until you heal the woundedness until you reclaim yourself back from that. And then forgiveness is, you know, I mean, there's many steps to that, but one thing that's important for forgiveness is to remember that forgiveness is remembering and letting go. So it's not, you know, when you forgive someone, and most of the time we don't tell them about it, right? Depending who they were in our lives or whatever, we don't tell them. So when you forgive someone, you're remembering and letting go. So you're acknowledging the pain and the hurt. And like I said, it's, it's easier and, and more full of a process to be completed in forgiveness when people heal their own pain. And then it's, so it's remembering and letting go, which is also grieving and letting go. And, um, <coughs> yeah, okay. This, this thing keeps moving around on me here, even when it doesn't move. Um, in other words, um, Rab, this is why I like the videos you make, AJ, to anyone out there. Um, make sure your, your coach or anyone you're following also has empathy. That's a good point, Rab, because when there's an absence of empathy, and that's, you know, a big red flag. Um... <coughs> Angry driver, my upper message didn't appear. Oh, I'm sorry about that. It might be, the, I don't know if you type too much or not, but there is a character limit, which is usually the reason, because otherwise I don't know why it wouldn't have come through. Um, Alpha Dog, I'm interested in the article. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It's out there. Um, GB Rose to Cargirl. I first heard that expression of, quote, opinions being none of our business, unquote. As an addict and alcoholic going to 20, 22 step programs, going to, I've only heard of 12 steps, but okay. 
for going to steps programs um i just don't know what you mean um i was so judgy and at my healthiest i learned that the more good i could see in other people the more good i could see in me that's interesting because that can help but it also works exactly in reverse more often than not in a more I don't want to say complete way, but in a more full way. That the more that we can, but sometimes people have to see good in others and be believed in and connect in a way to then take that in. But it, but how we perceive and respond to others is largely how we feel about ourselves. And then you said, um, I could the more good you can see you could see in you, the more good I could see in others. Circular momentum help with judgments. Okay. Like I said, it usually works largely the other way around, but perhaps after the initial way that it worked for you, then, then it was working the other way around. Um, well, yes, Chelsea, if you mean I remembered about your situation with your husband and uh, immigration, yes, I did. Thank you, driver. See, there was, there was more to that. I will pay them back message oh i'm sorry probably you ran out of characters or i don't know what happened there i'm rational when it comes to revenge i don't go for revenge revenge without thinking it through also for that you have to give me a proper reason well um i don't know if you're saying i have to give you a proper reason but i don't really have a reason to give you i don't know you um you need to find your own reason but i can't remember if you the person said you had a spd or not and i'm not trying to be you know, um, contentious, but people find the reason from their own conscience if and when they can. Um, wow, you're very welcome, Chelsea. Um, and, um, oh, you're very, yeah, you're very welcome. Help a dog. That makes perfect sense in regard to healing. And forgiveness. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, and Cargo, uh, you said, I honestly heard AJ say, say it. I just started on my own journey only about six months ago. That's interesting. Yeah, well, usually it comes from within. People have to find it from within. But there's variations of that, right? But often when people are working, you know, with someone in a process of recovery and healing, that also supports people connecting in ways that they can reframe the negative core beliefs that they have and work on the inner critic narrative which is invoked from a critical parent or invoked from the perception of a parent not being there when one needed them to be and uh Angry driver, do you think you can train effective empathy? Um, not, not really. I mean, and again, it depends because if you have, I'm sorry, I should, I can't scroll all the way back up, but if I'm remembering correctly, if you have ASPD, um, it's very likely that you might always, um, kind of just be out of the reach of empathy, but the more awareness that you have can definitely help you to work around that. If, if, you, if you so choose to do that and pay attention to that and be really aware of that. And Chelsea, the seeing the good in others part really made me, um, really made me see what meant about my father's past. Yeah, okay, that's good. And, um, angry driver, I mean, I can feel it a little bit for animals, but I think it's due to not connecting any negative emotions in my past so I'm basically able to trust them truly or fully sorry fully um I am the ASPD guy okay yeah I thought so um well and you know I I don't know for most people with ASPD feelings and empathy might be really difficult but again what's always said about every group of people or every you know people labeled with anything it's not going to be exactly the same for everybody and you said, um, also my revenge mostly oriented, um, about material gain. Oh, I see. Um, 
uh, in, can insult me, tell me bad names, um, whatever, as long as it's not affecting me in a way that I lose something. I want, I'm not affected by it, I don't um, hold grudges. Oh, okay, well, yeah, no, that's um, helpful that what you're sharing really helps um, me and hopefully others in their understanding. Melanie, thank you very much for that. I'm super appreciated. You guys are overwhelming me here. Um, another kind donation. Thank you so much. Um, super appreciated. Um, Alpha Dog, one of the problems with revenge is how far you are willing to go. Very true. Uh, if someone else is revenge-oriented, it can be very bad. I'm not willing to go as far as some people, so I avoid the revenge. Mindset, yes. Well, and I think it's really more healthy for people to avoid the revenge mindset anyway. And again, to realize that, you know, whether codependent, whether BPD, I don't know if narcissists and others recognize it or not. But, you know, one needs to make sure that they have their own house in order, that they're taking care of their own emotions and and implementing and understanding their own boundaries. Because... To seek revenge or to be really angry or to yell at someone or insult someone and that kind of thing. Um, and, and some people do that thinking that's standing up for themselves, but it's not. It's bullying and it's abusive. And so people have to really, you know, these are things that, we, you know, people need to learn. I needed to learn them years ago. And some people still need to learn them. But so um, revenge... What is that other saying? Revenge is a a dish best served cold. And the way I would interpret that, if I've got it anywhere near correct, <clears throat> is that the more you work on yourself, the more you heal, the longer it is between the wanted revenge and not taking any action. If If it's going to be served, best served cold, it's kind of like that means really by the time you get to where you might want to do that, or take action on something you don't want to anymore. It's sort of like if somebody served you a dish of food and it looked good, and then, I don't know, maybe there was, let's say, in one of these toxic relationships, I've been through this on both sides, um, there's an argument, and the food gets cold, and then everybody's stressed, nobody wants to eat, and it was a, it, it, that's an example of a dish not well served cold, right? Because who wants to eat it afterwards? So that's just my sort of loose interpretation of that in my mind at the moment. And I think it's really important, too, that you set up a dog. You know, you try to avoid the revenge mindset because it truly does become a mindset for people. It becomes a mind trap. And and for some people, they, they know, as I did many decades ago, three you know, like years ago, when I had the revenge fantasies, predominantly to my mother, not even as much to my father, which I never acted on. I always knew they were fantasies and I always knew I would never act on it. And then, you know, that got resolved over time, a long time ago. And it is a mindset though, and it can become a mind trap and it can be like a circular thing. You know, how you feel, if you're not aware of the thoughts you're thinking, what are the negative core beliefs, how you feel can just embolden and in strengthen the mind trap, the mindset, the negative core beliefs that can make the want or the fantasy or whatever of revenge stronger. And it's, it's just a cycle that keeps going around. Unfortunately, some people act it out. Um, hopefully, many more people get into some recovery healing and work with someone and be able to, you know, heal that and stop that cycle. Because, you know, everything starts with thoughts that are energy. That gets translated quickly into emotion. People aren't always aware. What's the thought? Like, I'm feeling this right now, but I don't know what thought created my feeling. And then some people go from, and not just people with BPD, but they go from thought, unconscious, feeling, boom, action. Which often leads to regret or remorse. Or in some people's cases, severe, depending what they do. Might be the police at the door. And a life of, uh, you know, a life ruined or a life taken if somebody has to go to jail type of thing. Because actions can be all kinds of different things, right? That's all I'm saying. Um, 
Alpha Dog. Um, oh, wait a second here. Um, Chelsea said, I, I only hurt people if I'm threatened and I haven't done that for years. Last time I hurt anyone physically was when I had an episode in public and that was years ago. And it was a man and I broke his arm. But this is because he had me backed up against a tree. But I don't know what I was doing. I can't remember. And you're sorry that you hurt him. Well, I mean, you know, self-defense is a whole different thing. But um, I think it's rather futile to think that there's anything like physical self-defense can be really important at times, right? Obviously. But there isn't any such equivalent in the psychological, emotional, or spiritual realm of, of our beingness. But people sometimes think that there is, and they pursue that. Um, which is, you know, it's, it's never self-defense to be passive aggressive or aggressive to someone, uh, even if they've hurt you, it's just, it's just not going to help you. It's going to make the whole thing, you know, the, the other person just up the ante and make everything worse. And then if it's somebody with BPD or NPD, uh, it's going to be, they're not going to, unless, well, if this is happening, they probably haven't had treatment or whatever, or whatever the case might be, then um, they're just going to up the ante. So, you know, and, and it's best to meet conflict, even if somebody's being really abusive, overly aggressive, intimidating, etc. It's best to meet that with just a calm demeanor because... Because A, you don't have to take it in. B, it's their narrative and their perception. And what they think doesn't belong to us, right? And the other thing is that if we engage that and heighten our level of response or reactivity to something really highly charged coming at us, then the person will up the ante. Because what's under all of this, people's pain, people's trauma, but people's need for control. So we have to be really in check with, like, I'm somebody who lives my life knowing I have autonomy over myself and my choices. That not make me perfect, but I'll take my own personal responsibility. I'll make my own choices. So if somebody's yelling and screaming at me or whatever, it's like, well, you know, I'm not going to listen to that for very long, number one. And number two, it has nothing to do with me, you know, because what people think of me has nothing to do with me. So whether that comes across as yelling or screaming or intimidation or however, you know, if it's not respectful, um, constructive criticism, then doesn't matter to me. Um, Alpha dog. Uh, and who wants to live in a world where revenge is important? Unfortunately, I think we do. But yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, it's best that we all move forward in a positive way as best we can. Absolutely. Uh, well, it's hard to say what happened there then, Chelsea, right? Oh, and you have some revenge, um, fantasies. Hmm. Hi there, CB. I hope you're doing well. Um, Alpha Dog Thought. Thought, then emotion, then action. Is that right, AJ? Yes. And often the thought piece is unconscious, right? So people will have a thought, but they might not be aware of it. And then boom, you're ensconced in emotion. And then sometimes emotion can lead to action that isn't the best for people often if, if people don't slow that process down. And that's really the sort of core of cognitive behavioral therapy anyway. That explains that so it's really important for people that are feeling a lot and maybe don't know why well then it's important to work with someone because you need to figure out what are the thoughts and negative core beliefs that are driving the emotions that might get you into some risky action or some definitely not positive action for yourself in your life or for anyone else really for that matter um C4 is revenge seems to spiral out of control. Yes, I think more often than not it does. A one-up game, yes. And and at the heart of it is control struggle, right? 
And some people can be aware of that, become aware of that, and know that. And other people with certain, you know, if they're untreated with certain diagnoses, may not. And so it's really important that when we are aware of that, we don't feed into the control that somebody else is trying to take away from us. And that's why I said, again, just, you know, speaking for myself, and I'm sure many others are the same, when if somebody yells at me or, you know, is intimidating or aggressive, et cetera, for whatever reason, then I'm, I know I have autonomy over myself. I'm going to stand in my own power. That's my personal power. I'm not going to let theirs infiltrate mine so that I have no need to fight back or try because it's always control at the heart of it. If people don't feel like they can just trust themselves with whatever's happening, if you respond back or react back in kind, then the other person's going to up the ante because, because you're getting out of control. And then the other person's going to feel like you're taking control from them because they don't understand their autonomy and its limits and boundaries and how to assert themselves versus other kinds of behavior. So it's really important to know about your own autonomy and be at peace with yourself and know yourself because then we don't have to power struggle with other people because I don't want anybody. I don't want power over anybody. I just am happy to have autonomy over myself. Otherwise, I like to help people. I get along with people in my life. I try to get along with most people online. Some people online make that impossible. I mean, over the course of years. and. And I don't know if I've had something to do with that here and there. I'm not going to say I'm perfect. But the bottom line is what they think of me is none of my business. I can't control what they do, what they think, what they say. But I, I'm just going to go along my merry way because I have my own autonomy. I have my own peace. I'm a strong person. I know who I am and I trust myself. So I didn't say all that to go whoopee me. I'm just, you know, giving that context. And I just thought I'd put it in the first person because I can't speak for other people, right? And so then you said, it's yes, it's a one-up game. Revenge is living well, although, well, the best revenge of all. What's one of the best quotes I've ever heard? Re the, the best revenge is successful living. And I adopted that early on in my recovery years ago, like in my early 20s. It was like, um, along with the Kenny Rogers song, right? Something Inside So Strong. I used to listen to that so many times. I still do sometimes, but it's like, you know, the more, I don't remember, what it, but the higher you build your barriers, the, the taller I will climb or whatever, the, you know, but not in the sense of trying to change somebody's, somebody's mind about you, but that something inside so strong song really helped me as well, because it was just like so motivating and helping me to reframe this idea years ago in recovery that, you know, like. I used to be somebody that felt really out of control. And so when you feel really out of control and somebody else, like in my family of origin, they were always out of control. And it was always like, for me, it was a reaction to like, hey, trying to survive and get them to stop being so controlling over me. But we can, we can work our way to our own autonomy, knowing ourselves well enough that we don't even have to engage that. And, um... So success is the best revenge. And that's what I set my sights on a lot of years ago. And that's where I believe I am today. And it doesn't make me perfect. And although I have an ex who will target that as it triggers um, envy. Hence, um, I live well quietly to hold the status quo. Yes, I hear you. But wise words from UC Forest, as always. Thank you very much for sharing that. And the other thing I'll say too about revenge or when people argue or when people are in toxic relationships with people who have more difficulty controlling their emotions, etc. Not that it always gets physical with everybody, but a lot of people, arguments and control struggles and toxic relating um, do end up in physical struggles. And when somebody starts that and maybe in a vengeful, revenge controlling type way, um, there can be accidents, you know, like somebody can just mean to punch somebody once, which is still wrong and abhorrent, but maybe they hit them so hard or in a place in a way that they really do more damage than they meant to, right? But that's hardly an excuse. Or somebody might go to push somebody real hard and they, you know, nobody's thinking in that moment, but it's inexcusable. 
and somebody goes falling over table something and then has lost their ability for any equilibrium, falls backwards and smacks their head on some blunt object or the floor and might actually lose their life right there. And then somebody who was just out of control and angry, but yes, was being abusive, therefore responsibility, can end up with accidents happening and things unexpected to whatever, you know, because they're not exactly thinking it through. So that's something else people need to think about. If you've been in a physical skirmish of late with somebody in your life, uh, because maybe they started or whatever, you really got to be careful about that's a big red flag not to be around that individual because accidents can happen within all of that control struggle stuff as well. <clears throat> and revenge and, and such. And DB said, um, I was raised um, to not let people take advantage of you uh, to fight. Um, revenge easily follow. Later in life, learn to, quote, turn the other cheek, unquote, without being a doormat. But OMG, today feels so, today feeling so spiteful. Oh. Well, and I think, you know, turning the other cheek, yeah, has nothing to do with being a doormat. It's, again, knowing oneself, having autonomy over oneself. And when, if somebody aggresses it, I mean, if they aggress at you physically, you have to defend yourself at some point, you do it. That's my thing, okay? But if it's going to just be yelling and screaming, intimidating, somebody's seeing me in a certain light that, you know, I'm not saying I've never done anything wrong or that I've never angered anybody, but... It, you know, if they're yelling and screaming, but I'm not going to engage it. And and B, if there's something that somebody thinks that I did do that hurt them, then they need to tell me about that in a respectful manner. And I will definitely listen to that and consider that. And if I'm wrong, I would apologize. So, you know, it's, it's um, people have to learn more about themselves as I did learn more about myself. It doesn't make us perfect, but we have to um, we can't control anybody else who is seeing us differently or has a different narrative or who might be hurtful or people that hurt us in the past, etc., or, you know, might hurt us in the future. You never know. So we just have to be, I don't like the word control. So having autonomy and being aware of ourselves and making really good choices and decisions for ourselves. Uh, Buffy, it's getting dizzying. She's running in and out of the room, chasing the cat. Hi, Buffy. Oh, yes, you're so cute. You are. No, get off, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, um, oh, you said today you're feeling so spiteful um, toward daughter's boyfriend. If anything makes me feel protective, it's my kids. Yes, but you have to remember she, you know, is dicey here, but she too made decisions, right? So I don't think he was ever any good for her at all. But yeah, I understand you would have feelings about him for sure. Uh, CB, as an adult child of a troubled mother, I had no chance, uh, no um, chance but to let go. It was her, I'm oh, sorry, I'm having trouble reading this from here because I got so much light in my face. It was hard, but freed me. I'm pretty sure she had cluster B, uh, cluster B salad of different things, including narcissism and HPD. Well, and, and that is a very, um, you know, I'm really happy for you. And I'm glad that you were able to do that for yourself because for many people that, you know, not, not for all necessarily, but for many people with parents like that or a parent like that, you really do have to do that for yourself. And, and it protects your emotional, psychological, spiritual, and your physical health. And you deserve to live a peaceful life because often when we grow up with them, they're abusive enough. You know, why should we keep allowing that? So that's the other thing I've been trying to say here, and I, I think I've said in different ways. Buffy, now is not the time, really. Um, actually, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, I've been trying to say something in different ways. Don't remember anymore. It's Buffy's fault. Um, get. Let me see. I guess because, yeah, especially as an adult child of a cluster B or whatever the case, and in my case, I've already said what it was. Um, 
like, you know, the family of origin probably pretty spiteful, pretty hateful of me in their minds, their lives. I don't care. Guess what? It's not affecting my health. Doesn't matter to me. It's not putting my blood pressure up. But interestingly enough, with all their hate, just as an example, right? With all their hate, and I don't think I'm the only person they hate. They're just, they're like that. They hate a lot of people. They probably hate, they hate themselves, first and foremostly. And that gets projected out to everybody else or a lot of other people. But when people do that, you know, it's interesting that the people, a few of them that have hated me for like a lot of years, um, which I really didn't deserve, you know, like I really didn't, but whatever. Um, they will, um, they have had multiple, many health crises over their, over the course of the last, you know, 30 plus years. And, um, Hey, you know, what, what we, what we resist and what we suppress is going to come back to bite one way or another. Right. So we need to open to healing and being the best each one of us that we can be. Many people aren't capable of that, and many people, capable or not, don't choose that. Uh, oh, you went no contact in 2009. Well, hopefully that you've worked that through and you feel better about it. And uh, totally that was my experience as well in um, about, I'm not sure, um, but 30, more than 30 years ago. <clears throat> so, um, and and, you know, that's that's the gift that we can give ourselves at that point. And you said, um, thank you, AJ. I hope you're well too. Yes, I am. Thank you very well. And um, thank you for that. Alpha dog. So then I should work on thinking positively. Well, that would help. And I think along with, but but people with negative core beliefs can't just think positively and create the deepest lasting change. So thinking positively helps but you're gonna probably have a little struggle with it in if you have still negative core beliefs so it, it's important to work those out too but thinking positively is definitely a step in the right direction uh, and maybe more too but i'm just saying with negative uh, especially negative core beliefs from childhood they really need to be understood uncovered and healed um, for the positive thinking um, or positive attitude to really be able to bring you to you as much as you deserve it to. CB, I understand the feeling for revenge, but ultimately seems um, futile and counterproductive. Yeah, well, I totally agree with you. I can understand it too, but I think it would be futile and counterproductive. Um <clears throat> Buffy, you gotta go lay down, please. Angry driver, that's a problem for me. Especially, no, hey, <laughs> especially regarding relationships when someone doesn't establish boundaries. Yeah, well, that can be difficult for just about anybody. CB, I'm standing in my own personal power, yes, and I won't let the energy of someone else affect me. That's incredible, AJ. Oh, I thought you were agreeing with me and said, but, but yeah. I mean, that's what I do. That's what lots of people do. I'm not saying I'm the only one that does that. But that's where everybody deserves to get to. And to know that place for themselves from the inside out. Doesn't she look like a kook back there? A cute one, but kooky and hyper. <laughs> um, and um, I hope you find that helpful, um, CB, and that you know you can set those boundaries, limits, and that intention and have that fully in your consciousness going forward in your own life too. That's a good question, Chelsea Ann, that you asked, angry driver. Does he or she see where the where the boundaries are? Uh, angry driver, I take things for, for granted um, very fast so I can then become unpleasant when they try um, to then come up with boundaries. Hmm. Ah. progress mm -hmm. yes I think when people are well here, here's an interesting thing too when people are trying to do better <clears throat> excuse me it's very important but again I would just caution people 
that they need to set an intent to do better in a conscious way, whether you're doing that on your own or you're in a healing recovery process working with somebody, you set the intent to do better and then you set the goals you need and you learn the coping skills and tools and strategies you need to do better because trying isn't doing and I'm not just playing semantics here or word games. It's really important. So many people say, like you could ask somebody in your life, are you going to do whatever it is? And they'll go, I'll try. Well, I don't have anyone in my life that would really say that to me. I don't think that I know well, right? But if somebody says to me, I'll try, I mean, clients do say that a lot and that's a different process, but I do try to reframe with clients that I'll try is less likely to produce the intended effect. Then I'm going to make a commitment to that. I'm going to set an intent to do that. And here's the strategy I'm going to use. And here are the goals, which I can help provide often. So um, trying isn't doing is, is really a key thing to learn if you don't already know it, because it will help you to be more successful when you build your foundation to what it is that you intend to do or are, quote, trying to do, unquote. I'm not just saying that to any one person. That's just a general statement. <clears throat> Um, yeah, if, if people are being toxic and they don't understand that, then yeah, it is their responsibility to learn and to figure that out. And, um, as Chelsea said, and, um, yeah, responsibility, how to do well in our society, be happy as we can be. Well, and people aim at happiness all the time, you know, and happiness is beautiful, wonderful thing, but it's not a con constant state of being or people that I've known that seem to be in a constant state of happiness, it doesn't really come out to be so true after a while. But people need to seek peace, their own autonomy, knowing themselves, calm, you know, um, boundaries. And yes, happiness comes and happiness is lovely, but happiness like a blissful or joyous experience isn't going to be an everyday state of life. So... People sometimes maybe stress happiness a tad too much. Happiness can become very quickly for a lot of people a very, um, it's not something you can hold all day long every day. Um, and, and it's something that becomes an unrealistic expectation often for people when really autonomy of self, um, boundaries, taking care of yourself, knowing yourself, um, finding yourself if need be and peace, peace and, 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 and those type of things first, you know, achieved, create happiness and happiness is always, I think to some degree or other in life, in its imperfection, uh, in flux, right? So, and I, and I know a lot of happiness in my life. And then sometimes it's a joy experience, joy with the happiness. And sometimes you get the peak experience of bliss. But again, peak experience means it's not going to be there 24-7. Because that would even, wouldn't even even be, quote, normal, unquote. Um, Alpha Dog, one of my favorite um, shows is, quote, Fear Thy Neighbor, unquote. Oh, I haven't heard of that one. It's stories about neighbors whose relationships devolve and end in uh, murder. Hmm. I always wonder why one party doesn't stop escalating things. Well, you get two parties that are out of control, maybe often with, you know, I, I don't believe, quote, personality disorders, but perhaps some real mental health challenges. And that's what happens when somebody ups the ante, Somebody else ups the ante. Somebody else ups the ante higher and higher and higher. Not always, but in all too many cases, it ends up with one person not breathing anymore. Which is tragic and, of course, aberrant and not to be sanctioned. And in some cases, people get themselves into such states. Whether or not they have certain diagnoses, many diagnoses could be part of this, but no diagnosis could exist as well that people get into the sort of like, I'm going to get you and then I'm going to get me. 
And so they take up the other person and themselves. So, and these are things that a lot of people never see coming or have not listened to their gut instincts or knowing about and, and, or they can't control their own need for conflict, which does become a need and an addiction for people. If it comes from childhood and on up till unless people get help with that, then they, yeah, people just stay together and these cycles escalate and horrible things do happen. Not always, but off, you know, enough of the time, which is too much of the time. Angry driver, to, um, <coughs> I'm not sure what that's about. Yes, delayed gratification is really uh, important, beneficial, and a strength that people need to, if they don't already have it, build that up. Um, CB, I don't feel any desire for revenge towards my BPX. I know he's suffering. I have CPTSD and sometimes I get angry that I have this as a result of my relationship, but still. Well, yeah, and... And he is suffering, and, and of course, there's the thing for people with BPD, right? That nobody asks to have, quote, the label, quote, whatever BPD is, which is, I think, a trauma response in childhood, from childhood. Um, it's a response to childhood trauma, what I'm really trying to say, instead of saying it backwards. But yeah, um, so then people are hurting, but it doesn't give them to, the right to cross other people's boundaries or abuse people, right? So, um, um, <coughs> yeah, so you're going to look up delayed gratification. Cool. Um, CBS sometimes feel personality disorders may have to do with the Jungian theory of the shadow self. Even if it does, though, they don't have to be called, quote, personality disorders, unquote, right? But you said, but then you said all aspects of the shadow that are not integrated are those things that misfire in the end. Yeah, and it's not all about just misfiring. It's trauma and people that, when, and it's interesting that you said, right, what's not integrated. Well, people with BPD have a fragmented off self uh, part of ego. A child part of ego so yes they're not integrated until unless they do enough therapy to be integrated right which is a big part of that recovery and people with narcissistic personality are not integrated either and many i guess won't want help and that won't happen um and then there's lesser degrees of that fragmentation which is also in codependency but to a lesser degree wherein there's a wounded inner child really repressed into the unconscious and and it's having an effect in people's lives today but they don't realize how and so there's aspects of shadow uh for people that have various different degrees of adverse child experience or trauma or trauma in adulthood and um yeah there's there's a lot to the Jungian idea and theory of, of the shadow but it's certainly not a place that people can park their responsibility. Um, CB, they seem to be the things, but they themselves suffer from, and they also express towards others in chaotic and hurtful ways. Yes, because, again, it goes back to object relations, and for people with BPD, and even people with NPD, though, it's it's more entrenched and different in a lot of ways. Um, it's the object other relating, and it was it was the the split that happens at different ages in childhood when people are gonna have you know have the trauma response known as BPD or even the trauma response known as NPD, and um, it it is about fragmentation, ego fragmentation, loss of self, the false self rises, and so you know maybe in some way Jung was speaking to the false self, but. Maybe not always meaning the false self with the shadow self, but everybody has a false self. It's just that when you know yourself well, the false self doesn't have the same kind of power as when the false self is in the lead because of a lost self, in the case of BPD or NPD. 
Um, CB, thank you, AJ. Very kind. I love my mother. And moving on was hard, but I had to, um, and I'm okay now. She was so toxic, unbelievable. It was a weight off my shoulders when I left. Well, yeah, and I'm glad that you're there now because I know it's not an easy thing in the beginning, but yes, it's, it becomes a very freeing thing, doesn't it? Oh, thank you for that. She is adorable. She's also like really crazy hyper right now. And I've got a couple of fans going on low that I hope you can't hear because otherwise she'd just be panting her head off, but she keeps trying to chase Rafe out of the room. So that's what's happening there, driving her crazy. And then she gets hot and then she pants and, you know, et cetera. <laughs> Um, Alpha Dog, um, AJ, not sure I can heal my negative core beliefs. I was bullied, um, for being a ginger and other things. Plus I struggle, I struggle with attention deficit disorder. So I'm kind of defective. Work is a struggle. Well, but see, there's a negative core belief, um, that you're defective. I don't think you're defective. Sounds like you have some challenges and it sounds like you don't feel really good about yourself a lot in some ways but it doesn't mean you're defective and i'm sorry to hear about the bullying um because that you know that's horrible to go through as so many of us do know and um you said you're not sure you can heal your negative core beliefs well you know you can but guess what you have to give yourself a little leeway of belief that you can so that might sound weird but it's sort of like you, you're not sure you can, but like maybe when you said to having a more positive attitude or thinking more positively, you could err on the side of, well, I'm not sure. I don't know, but maybe, and then set an intent to see if in fact you can do that. And again, you might need to work with somebody. It's hard for people to do that alone, but I think that, um, you are, I think what you're voicing here, Alpha Dog, is a lot of things that that are blocking you, that are negative core beliefs. And yes, you can heal those. And so, um, where was I here? <coughs> um, oh yeah, Alpha Dog said, I tend to put what energy I have into that. And you mean, oh, work is a struggle, so do you tend to put your energy more into work? Um, and you said, not all wounds heal. Like my ulcer is a chronic condition um or am i mistaken mm, i had an ulcer years ago i don't have now but i still have a little bit about it like ibs is still there but not that much of a problem anymore but i guess what i would say about that is um if one believes that not all wounds heal well it's different for everybody to the degree to which people can heal or not maybe a lot of different circumstances but even if you can't heal a wound, say, to the max or the most degree that you'd like to, because there's no perfection in humanity, but if, if you want that 90% or that 95% healed, then that's possible. But maybe for different people, there's different ranges. So I would just encourage you, Alpha Dog, to think about, well, maybe not all wounds heal, but how about doing as much as you can to see how much you can heal some more, right? So I think, and that's something I think people are doing in many ways and, or if not in an active healing process, certainly a growth process over the course of life in which we learn, we grow, hopefully we adapt and we're, we're flexible to our vulnerability to change. Again, nothing is written in stone unless we write it there somewhere in our minds or unconsciously from childhood and continue to believe the negative core beliefs. But are there people that have, like I have high functioning Asperger's, it's not going anywhere. So what I do with that is I do my best with that. I do really well with that. Does it sometimes present a little bit of a problem? Yeah, I deal with that. I map it. I push the limits of that, but it's not going away. So what does that mean, though? I've learned so much. I do so much better in relating. So, and, and if one has an ulcer that hasn't healed, then perhaps the reason is that maybe not so much that it doesn't, doesn't, sorry, that it never healed, but that the same stressors keep on reopening the wound, so to speak. So again, we're not talking about perfection in the human condition, but healing wounds 
to sufficient degrees changes people's lives and really does take people out of painful relational patterns, helps people create healthy boundaries, helps people to know themselves, helps people to have a self-esteem, healthy self-esteem, healthy self-worth, and, you know, to not engage toxic people anymore, basically. Um, which isn't a struggle in my life, but it's still a tad bit of one here online. But then I can't help what other people choose. So then I just kind of, you know, let it go. What can you do? And that's over the course of years. And, you know, just talking about trolls and people that way back before we had all the social media platforms used to just email you and insult you. But see, when people do that, they're hurting. And it's coming from something they haven't realized inside. And again, because if it's anything less than a reasonable, mature dialogue, which contains healthy feedback or constructive criticism, then it's not something I'm going to engage. And that's where everybody, I think, would be best off to get to in their lives. And... um I'm sorry, just a second, I gotta scroll back up. Um, so yeah, and then uh, CB said, Elpa, you are not defective or broken. You sound like a great person. Yeah, I second that. And Elpa kind of went, nah. I struggle too much and don't have the energy to do the things I need to do. Um, but you said, thanks for the thought, CB. Well, and again, you know, Alpha Dog, it sounds like there's some real negative core beliefs that they're much more pervasive in your experience than maybe you realize in a conscious way. And I don't, that's no criticism or judgment. I'm just saying that in the hopes that if you choose, you can try to be more consciously aware of that. And again, get into a process of healing and recovery and keep trying to work through it. And, um, uh, CB, autonomy seems easy compared to peace. Well, autonomy, personal autonomy brings peace. I would put it that way. That's my experience. Alpha dog, the revenge stuff isn't just tragic, but it seems easily avoidable. That's what um, saddens me the most. Well, yeah, and can I just say that what seems easily avoidable is impossible to avoid for, pe to avoid for people that are in all of these toxic mind traps and trauma from the past. It, it looks from the outside easy to avoid, but for those people, it's a collision course that keeps escalating. And like I said, not always to that outcome, but way too often. But for them, it's not easy to avoid at all because they're stuck right up in it. Oh, Deb, um, Deb Lewis, thank you so much for that, boy. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed here, people. What a generous, they're all generous donations. Thank you so very, very much. Um, I'm just really, wow, an alpha dog, another, another, I'm, I'm, you guys are just overwhelming me here, honest to God. Thank you so much. Um, I just, I don't know how to express my gratitude. Um, just thank you so much, really. It's, it's I'm very touched, um, very moving. Thank you. And um, Deb Lewis, hi, lady. <laughs> Just wanted to send some love and support. Well, thank you so much again. You said, I'm still hoping um, to connect with you for some hours of coaching. Have you ever heard of targeted individuals? I'm just curious. Yes, I've not only heard of it. One could argue I still am a little bit of one, but I have been one in my life. Yes, I'm very familiar with that unfortunately in lived experience, but also in working with clients. And thank you again for your donation. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, CB, I'm actually in a great conflict. Um, my ex was traumatized in childhood and has nightmares all the time that are related to it, and it affects him greatly. He doesn't realize where the dreams come from. Well, yeah, and, and, and what part of that, without sounding insensitive or unempathic, what part of that is your great conflict and why? Because if you think about it, I would suggest there's a way out of that because 
unfortunately, that is his experience. He didn't ask for that in childhood, but now it's his responsibility to get some help for that so that he can feel better, so that he can learn what's happening and to cope better. So this is another thing I just want to say to people with codependency. I'm not aiming this at you. Um, who said that? CB. But when you continue to feel so much for them, oh yeah, compassion, to have compassion for someone and their plight, that's healthy. But again, not to be dwelling on it, not to be thinking about it more than you are living the course of your life. Because again, I don't mean this in a hard ass way. We can't be responsible for anybody else's circumstance. And especially when they won't go get help themselves, especially if they don't want our help. We can't force help on them. I think lots of people have tried that help, you know, fix, rescue, enable all of that. So there's another place to look at what are you holding on to that you would still be, you would benefit greatly from letting go of, right? So the great conflict is really something that might be, as you said, housed right there with that person that you still have compassion for. Or it might be something that is still multi-layered, but you deserve to set yourself free from that conflict. It doesn't sound like it's yours. Um, CB, but I know where the dream comes from. I don't want to tell him because it would make him remember the trauma and I think it would harm him and not help. I'm just not qualified. Well, and may I just say, CB, that's so wise of you, but you have to let, well, you, be best for you then to let that go as opposed to hold on to that because if he would seek some help, then I'm sure somebody else could help him to understand what it is you understand. Oh, thank you, Deb uh, Lewis. Um, my dog is precious. I have another one laying back there too, but he just... She loves the camera. He's he's like chill to not worry about what I'm doing right now. Um, and Rab, um, AJ, could the could the dreams about someone's ex mean that they want closure with this person, or is it just a form of PTSD? Well, Rab, it, it could be either actual. Uh, uh, actually, I don't usually talk backwards. It could actually be either and or both. So especially with PTSD or CPTSD, it can be a form of a flashback still of things you need to resolve more or a person needs to resolve more. But dreams can also very much be, you know, it's, it's like the brain and, and therefore the mind is trying to work out things that are, that are still going on unconsciously, definitely in REM sleep, right? I mean, I wake up with some of the craziest dreams and I'm like, and sometimes they're important because if they come with feelings, I'll look at them and I'll be able to establish what that kind of means for me. Sometimes they're just so silly. I'm like, ah, you know, but, but yeah, I think it's still, it could be lack of closure and it could be other things as well. But often for people that are exes of somebody with BPD or ex of a narcissist or have a BPD or narcissistic parent, depending on how that went, um, Often it can be a lack of closure, but it can also be other types of still in the unconscious conflicts that might not be in your conscious mind. And so that will come out in dreams um, often because you're not aware of it consciously, if that makes any sense. And so definitely it can be both or either or, but it doesn't have to be either or all the time. An angry driver, I wonder what causes me to become how I am today. I barely remember anything from the years when I was 5 to 14 besides some very few moments that were not that bad. Well, I mean, that's that's a big question, and it would go to the heart of your diagnoses, right? And so maybe for you that means you want to inquire more with, with, with someone in um, like a professional to try to, you know, or, or, you know, cause I don't know if you're going to be able to really figure that out, but you know, if, if it's something that you want to know more about, then maybe talking to somebody about it might be helpful to that extent. 
Um, yeah, CB said, I need to let go. If I try to help, that's perhaps just my caretaking still active. Well, yes, it, 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 it is basically right. And it's good that you're aware of that. And again, like, like the thumbnail, which I don't just sometimes make thumbnails. Well, sometimes they're not so pretty, right? But, um, you know, people need to ask themselves and be very consciously aware, whatever you're dealing with in your life, right? Are you holding on or are you letting go? Or are you at least moving from holding on to the process of letting go? And there's many times over we'll have to make those choices. It's not always just about one borderline, one narcissist, one parent, one... No, we'll have to make that choice probably several times in our lives. Are we holding on to something or are we letting it go? And, and for many people, often what that is it might still be a lack of self-awareness on some level, but it might also just be, I shouldn't say just, but it might, it, it just could be so many different things that people feel or, or yeah, I was going to say it could also be from the, um, interjected narrative of a critical or abusing parent and it could still be from the inner critic inside which is all addressed really in family of origin work and inner child healing work um don't mean to make it sound like work but you know it's a process um yeah i'm sorry to hear that angry driver you you went through a lot of trauma in your childhood for sure um, and see for us karma means action rather than justice or revenge very good point yes something I learned that helped me decide um, yeah just okay something I learned that helped me decide that action must be positive for oneself yes very well put and I think I've been alluding to that although not in your succinct wise way that you always have um, in terms of personal autonomy um, and that we want to be not in reactive places that if there's something we need to respond to we want to respond if we need to respond but we don't want to be reacting back right to whatever and um, and uh, because there's, you know for every action like karma right for every action there is an equal and opposite one and when people are in these control struggles of um, not knowing themselves and or trauma and and or needing to heal and or heal more whatever the case might be in people's lives um yeah i mean it's really important to think about karma and um yes uh, this sense that people can get justice or revenge you know um neither it, well i mean revenge people get more than they get justice if they seek it i suppose if that's the way they, they choose to act or um, act out. But justice is like fairness, right? I mean, when it's outside the legal system, I mean, even in the legal system, there, there are more concepts and they don't exactly apply to experience. And, th and then they become as much as we should have justice, right? Or it would be, I shouldn't say should, would be nice to have justice in a lot of circumstances, or for something to be fair or fairer. I don't use those words in, in my life or, you know, from my reference anymore because I see them as more like not even good philosophical constructs because, or concepts, because they set people up the way that they're using language, right? And the way that we're taught that, oh, this is supposed to be the case. They set people up with rather unrealistic expectations compared to what life usually shows us or life gives us the opportunity to grow through and so i'll just give one quick example you know i was sexually abused by my father and some other adults and at a certain point in my life many years ago i was like yeah um i was going through that healing and recovery so i'd go through all those flashbacks etc i was a bit incredulous and very angry about that at the time but glad to be healing and so I inquired, you know, I, I actually called the police. I told them what happened. I, but, you know, of course there was no Mormon tabernacle choir for witnesses. There were one or two other people that knew about this, but they weren't going to say anything. And so that to prove it was going to be very difficult. 
But it was hours and hours of meeting with um, detectives who, you know, as they will do to make sure you're telling the truth, come at you with questions for hours from every angle. And after that process, they were just about to go and approach my father and then see what could be done, whether charges could be laid, etc. And I was still just at the tail end of my recovery. <clears throat> so I was still just finishing off the last group um, therapy that I was in many years ago at this time. And I remember processing and asking the question in therapy as well. Am I seeking justice or am I seeking revenge? And I wasn't sure. And at that point in time, let me see, it was going to be, it was approximately seven years before my father died anyway. And I wasn't in contact, so I didn't know what was going on there. And then I didn't find out till eight months later. But my point is, as they were about to go and approach my father and to see whether or not they could do anything, and I don't know that it could have ever been proven um, in court beyond a reasonable doubt, etc., even though it happened, um, I decided to withdraw from it. Like, I phoned the detective and I said, you know, I've changed my mind and I don't want you to go forward with this. And luckily, they could respect my wishes and because it wasn't going to be the strongest evidentiary case, but when I didn't know if I was seeking justice or revenge, I decided whichever I don't want either. So that was just something that happened in my life that taught me a big lesson and for which I am, you know, spiritually grateful and in my faith-based practice, really grateful to God because it seemed like that was something I was really given inquiry and thought to, but it also seemed like it was very much a faith-based spiritual experience. He would go on to die seven years later. And, and my rationale at that time was not knowing whether I was wanting, mean, maybe I wanted both, you know, maybe I wanted both justice and revenge. Who knows? I don't know anymore because I didn't know back then. And I let it go. I didn't hold on to it. And the thing is that um, I think that I asked myself in trying to think about that really critically, what is it going to change for me in my life if he was found guilty of what he actually did and which caused me a lot of things in my life, um, was that going to make me any better, any happier, change my life? And the answer was no. And then I thought, well, he's getting older anyways. And so, yeah, I just, so with all that said, I don't seek justice. I mean, if there's a legal reason to bring something to a legal court, which I've had before, and, and if I do again, sometimes when it's serious, I will entertain that, but otherwise I'd rather not. Um, but even so, no one knows if there's going to be justice, right? Um, and I just believe that fairness is a trap, a mind trap, an emotional trap, and a place best not gone. So I love your words, C. Forrest, about karma. Because that's really the way people should think about things. And then what's important about that is each person is responsible for their own karma. And other people shouldn't be judging or worrying about other people's karma. And um, CB, emotional wounds expressing themselves physically. That's fascinating and frustrating. Yes, uh, but it happens. I wish I knew how to solve those tension headaches. Well, maybe by the more, maybe there's more to let go, right? That you're holding on to might really help you. And de-stressing and relaxing, whether that's relaxation exercises, mindfulness practice, uh, meditation, um, can usually be helpful. But it, but if you're still having those kind of headaches, uh, people have different symptomology in all areas of their body. It's really important to, to look at, you know, ask yourself in journal, what am I holding on to that I still need to let go of? Um, because there are base conflicts that emotionally and psychologically, and literally in the case of a headache, let me just insert this here, from Dr. William Glasser, Reality Therapy, and I forget his second book, but his theory, which I learned about, you know, in, in studying social work, among other things that was really applicable to my life many years ago because I was going through stuff. It was in the 80s when I learned that. Basically, it was align your reality with your behavior, with your, align your behavior with your reality, align your ethics, your values, your morals, your, just, just congruence, basically, which some people can't achieve for many reasons. 
But he also explained in that book and in that theory, and I know it's been probably even more elaborately explained in neuroscience now, but headaches can often be the stress, the psychological, emotional, or even spiritual, if you're stressed, the stress that is becomes physical. And so with headaches in particular, what Dr. William Glasser said about this was that it is neurons you have the same thought, the neurons are firing down the same neural pathway until the point of like it hurts. And that isn't what all headaches are caused by, but that's what a lot of stress-related headaches are caused by. So what helps there is asking yourself, what am I holding on to? What do I need to let go? What's the inherent conflict that's causing the stress and I end up having a headache? And then maybe there's some thoughts you're not even consciously aware of that you're having that you need to bring into consciousness to find out how you can then reframe the thoughts. Because when we reframe a thought, we introduce a new thought with intention to really think and go toward that thought and make that a new reality, so to speak, a new way of looking at things, new perception. Then it creates a new neural pathway. It's going to take the pressure off the one that's worn out with the same thought, same thought, same thought, or thoughts. So I just thought that I would insert that here. And um, Alpha Dog, thanks, CB. Um, my attention deficit disorder, this is something I have to manage, but thank you. Well, yeah, that's something that maybe people don't experience healing or maybe sometimes not even a lot of relief from. But again, the more you manage it and the more effectively you can do that, I hope you won't consider that a block to maybe being able to learn more about negative core beliefs and to be able to heal other wounds at least more right um uh nicole um good evening aj hey there deb lewis you deserve every bit of it oh thank you so much um i'm still just humbled and um overwhelmed oh thank you An another donation i'm extremely overwhelmed now um Thank you so much, uh, Deb Lewis. Again, I super appreciate it. And um, yeah, I'm very humbled. It's, it's, thank you. Um, and then Deb Lewis, you said, wow, that's some real food for thought. Me too. And CB, um, yes, absolutely. I agree. He's a grown man and is responsible for his own health. Edith, hey there. Hi, I had to catch um, you this week. Sorry, I'm so late. Oh, that's okay. It'll be there to watch later. I just hope the comments come and everything because Sometimes they don't get processed right, and YouTube is way behind in processing live streams. So probably because there are more live streams, but maybe because they have less employees still working or something. I don't know. Um, you think they could do that remotely or something? I have no idea how that works. Oh, I'm glad, um, Angie Driver, that you talked to a therapist who diagnosed you, and um, but they couldn't figure it out either. It's kind of a cluster of things. Could be my NPD grandparents, NPD aunt, brainwashing me. The things I saw are due to your sister. Well, yes, that's a lot of trauma for sure. Um, and Deb Lewis, that's earmarked for dog treats. Oh, yes, earmarked for dog treats. Okay, thank you. I'll make sure to put it toward dog treats. Interestingly enough, uh, let's see, not tomorrow. I think Monday I'm going to have enough time. To do the order for the dogs like their food they still have lots but i got to get more in and i will make sure to get them some extra i was going to get them some treats but i'll get them some extra treats um thank you so much rav to alpha all sort of colitis can get better i have it and i followed an elimination diet also look into the work of gabor mate yes well yes his work is seminal quote when the body says no unquote yes I know my codependency and people-pleasing were part of contributing to this condition. Well, yes, because that was, and that's what you, and I'm not saying there isn't something else, there could be or not, but that's where your stressors came from, yes. And um, I'm sorry to hear that, Angry Driver. Yes, a lot of trauma in your childhood. And um, Alpha Dog to angry driver i had some similar stuff but i i adopted more of a hippie win-win mindset well, that's interesting even though the people around you 
as a child were horrible. Most people aren't like that. Very true. Um, an alpha dog, can you develop a win-win mindset? I think it helps with relationships. It does as long as you're not um, placing yourself in trying to create a win-win that the other person isn't meeting you in the center of with mutuality and reciprocity. Because you can't, you can't create a win-win from a win-lose, right? So it's just important to keep that in mind. But I think in healthier relationships, people absolutely can have mutuality, healthier relating, more respect, etc. foundational things to healthy relationships, uh, not be dependent on each other, independent, but share and give and take. Um, and I think in that regard, um, where'd your comment go? That can definitely create a win-win between two people who are respectful and mu have mutuality and reciprocity and are able to dialogue and communicate effectively. Um, so all of that, yes, in healthy relationships. So it's possible to develop that, but each person has to be in their own, you know, as healed as possible place, consciously aware. And then you need to really kind of pay attention to who you're relating to, whether it's a significant other relationship or a friend or what have you. Uh, CB, OMG, AJ, so sorry. You were so brave to call the police. Um, well, yeah, well, I don't know about that. I guess I was, it was just when I was dealing with it all and you know, it, it was unfair. It was abhorrent. It was an injustice, but again, I was holding that for at that time way ages ago, but I let that go a long time ago. And that's what, so that's why I'm always also saying to people, radically accept where you are, radically accept what's happened to you. It seems like a really impossible thing to do. But with radical acceptance and getting to that neutrality of what was, was, what is, is, and it's not horrible and it's not terrific and it's not good and it's not bad. When people can do that, that helps in the process of letting go of what you're otherwise holding on to and discovering more and more about what that's about. So yeah, I mean, my childhood wasn't the worst childhood on earth. I'm not saying that. But it certainly was an atrocity, but there but for the grace of God go I. And I worked hard. And so there were some times through that, like when I did call the police. But then, you know, I I learned critical thinking through all my healing. And back then I was like, wait a minute, do I want justice or revenge? And then it seemed like either way, the other question that I was processing, it came to my mind that I think really, really was, was a good one and mattered was so how is it going to change your life moving forward? I was getting into a much better place. If he were to be put in jail for that at his age and blah, blah, you know, and I just decided I wasn't going to hold on to it. I just let it go. Of course, you know, I was working through the trauma healing and, um, and then working through the grief of that and letting it go. That is really something that I'm glad I came up with this thumbnail. I didn't know what thumbnail to use today, but yeah. Are you holding on to something or everything, or are you starting to let go or have you let go of a lot? Is there something else you still need to let go of? This is critical for people to think about. So helpful, so central in any healing and recovery journey. When people can gain more awareness of what they're holding on to versus what they need to let go of, and I think, oh, what I was going to say earlier was that when Buffy interrupted me, but I'm often reminding people that we need to embrace, not only radically accept, but embrace pain. The adversity of pain that is an atrocity that so many of us shouldn't have had to go through in various different iterations of what that means in people's lives. Be that kite that flies higher into the winds of adversity, because that's something that I, intent, I with intent did in my life. And that's not whoopee me. You know, everybody has a strength inside to tap into, to take that journey. But it involves embracing pain, getting to a neutral place with pain versus happiness, pain versus relief, because it's okay to hurt. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to have high anxiety. It's, because when you learn how to manage all this and embracing it,
and radically accept. And this isn't horrible in that nobody wants to be in anxiety or high anxiety or have a panic attack. But when you learn how to cope with that, you can really cope with it. Like, you know, I'm not going to say I never get anxious. If I get anxious, I can bring it down in a heartbeat if it's very high and it, not often. And I can just cut it off at the knees because I practiced it for years. So, you know, inherent with Asperger's syndrome, a little bit of anxiety in the hardwiring there. And so I deal with it. And the thing is, we need to embrace the paradox of life and get out of all of the dichotomies because holding on or letting go are dichotomous as well. But when you, when you have intent and you set the intent and you meet in the middle of paradox in neutrality and you say, well, I'm holding on, you take the inventory, I'm holding on to all this, I need to let go of all this, then you start the process of you know, stopping the holding on to moving through the letting go, which is always going to be paradoxically about adversity and embracing pain and needing to grieve. But it's not that it's not okay. And the more that people can understand in this paradox that to be hurt, to feel hurt, to be aggrieved, to be grieving is as okay as to be laughing your ass off. And when you look at it like that, you work through the grief. I even appreciate pain when I feel it. I mean, I don't necessarily enjoy it or anything, but I'm like, okay, good. Like I talked about a few live streams ago, which has really been minimal now. It's sort of passing. I had this emotional pain rising through my body. So I don't know what it was about. And it kept coming up and then up to my throat. And then it would just dissolve. And I think I cried once or twice, but I didn't really know what it was about. So I just decided, oh, well, this just might be a piece of something older. And I don't really, and I remembered back in my recovery how that would happen a lot. Sometimes we need to cry. Sometimes we need to put voice and tears and grief to something. And sometimes something is still in the body and it's so old and it's just finding its way out and we're going to feel it. And we just need to be with it and sit with it. Matter of fact, I did a whole live stream feeling it because I was with it. It was okay. Where What we don't resist can't find the energy to keep persisting. Let me put it that way. So... And of course, the more people practice skills and tools, the easier you're going to be able to access them in all kinds of adverse experiences. And and I became, an, well, for want of a lot, I don't have another word, an expert as a person, as a human being in dealing with grief and whatnot, because I had so much grieving to do, you know, and then I had to grieve the last years or part of the last years because of the trauma of my childhood. And when I was in therapy, et cetera, et cetera to find myself, but again, choose to get letting it go, not keep holding on to it. These are two massive, humongous, central things that people are often not aware of in their life, what they're holding versus what they really need to let go of. And guess what? It's your right to let it go. Because, you know, we're not letting go usually of things that are ours, you know, that, but we have to let go of what we realize about ourselves and change and grow in whatever ways we can. And, um, and Alpha Dog, of course you had behaviors that were different. You said you're on the spectrum, right? Um, I don't know if you're talking to angry driver there or me. Because I'm just on the um, autistic spectrum. Thank you very much. Not a mental health disorder. Not a freaking personality disorder. Not a mental health issue at all. <clears throat> and um, so I don't know if you're talking to what Angry Driver just said, actually. Uh, it looks like you two are talking to each other. Yes. Okay. So I just want to keep that straight. Um Yes, I think you two are engaged in discussion there. So I don't want to poke in the middle and um, misinterpret something. Well, this is interesting. I see that one comment in, in your discussion there with Angry Driver, Elf Dog, where you said, we compete to make each other better, not to dominate. We don't have to compete to make each other better. All we have to do is take care of our own house so to speak our own ourselves 
and not necessarily make ourselves better than others, but make ourselves better, the best, like I'm trying to be the best me I can be. If everybody's being the best you that you can be, then there's no need to compete to make anybody else better. It, uh, that might be a little bit of a codependent ideology there. I'm not sure. So uh, that, that looks like a really interesting conversation you two are having, and hopefully that will be interesting to people who might um, listen and watch back. Um, oh, gee, I like that, Alpha Dog, as you're talking to angry driver and i'm not following the conversation um just because you know it's fine that you got you you two are engaged in that that's great um but then you said i'll take a picture of this yes alpha dog did say i really like the book against empath the case for rational compassion i'm gonna order that sucker tonight because me too there's so much unhealthy levels of empathy going on out there. It's not empathy anymore. It's not helping anybody, and it's hurting a lot of people. Um, Clover, I'm not happy being alone. Well, and you know, Clover, I think that's because you need to know yourself more, and you need to work with someone on things you've mentioned in live streams before, where your parents didn't teach you the social skills that you need and probably didn't help you with knowing yourself. So you need to get into a process of healing so you can feel better about yourself. So you can be happy being alone. Doesn't mean you always have to be alone. But when I'm on my own, I'm fine. It's great. I love solitude. Um, yes, against empathy. Well, I'm not against empathy, but I'm against unhealthy empathy. Um, empathy is being really overblown. And I like that the book includes, you know, the case for rational compassion, because yes, we're losing a sense of compassion to what is radical, unhealthy empathy out there. You know, I mean, just out there in general for a lot of people, right? Um, and uh, that's quite the conversation you two are having. But once in a while, it comes up for air, and I can point something out, and that's cool, uh, so to speak. Cargirl, AJ, I'm in the middle of position on the thumbnail. Oh, okay, so I forget what that says. Um, not in action, right? So that's true, because a lot of people will be holding on to things, get conscious awareness of that, then be in that middle place as you're trying to move toward letting go. Because letting go is a process. Letting go usually, um, for most people, involves some working with someone in a recovering healing process. So that makes a lot of sense. And you said, my codependent self can't seem to leave because of hurting my partner yet. Well, so you're putting your partner's feelings ahead of yours, right? So you're holding on to your partner's feelings, and you're not even holding on to your feelings. And, and you're in the middle there trying to sort of like get into action with what you got to let go of, right? Sounds like. And you said again, it's just a chaotic mess. I'm ready for therapy when you get classes going. Well, and the thing about that too is that the fact that you're aware it's a chaotic mess, maybe there's a little bit you can start to do right now by just maybe journaling and asking yourself, why am I involved in this? Why am I still... And it's not going to give you all the answers of the way out, but it will help. What What is still drawing you or holding you? How? Why are you still holding on to the chaotic mess? Which, you know, that that's just a way to start processing. It's not going to be the whole answer in and of itself. And DB, quote, what we don't resist can't find the energy to persist. AJ, thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Um, yes, that's my, I just created that today. As I said it, so there you go. Never read it. I'm not saying it's new under the sun, but like, hey, it just might be a quote of mine. I have many of them, you know. So keep intending to go back to some of the motivational, inspirational writing that I that I have. If anybody wants to check for some of it, it's a, it might be a little. I don't know what it looks like today, but soul s o u l self help all one word dot o n dot c a probably a link. It's an archaic site now been up since 1995 
probably a link on that site that says soul slot of the day or something like that that would be me i used to go by the handle of soul <laughs> for some reason so very soulful person actually but anyway um sugar plum enigma i love that name hi aj um you got a new chair yay well i i guess you haven't been watching for a while but yeah i've had this chair for a while it's nice and comfy and you know like i could sit in the desk chair or whatever but like it really gets hard on the butt right so um not not a new chair but not a really old chair how's that just a nice comfy chair i have two chairs like this one in this color that match the couch and i have a piece of the other piece of the couch in the living room and then i have two entirely different recliner chairs but i love these these are this one and the other one that's in the same blue is rocker recliner and it means it swivels too so lots of fun but really really uh comfy and um oh alpha dog i don't know why you're saying sorry there's nothing to be sorry about you know um it's fine I just took out a few of the little treasures of what you said from your conversation with um, Angry Driver, which is fine. You you two were relating, so I hope that's a, there's no need to apologize. Um, DB Cargirl, I'm with you. Uh, definitely up for some classes if there's an option at some point for um, yeah group work. I know I, I I need I'm I'm right now in the middle of trying to find time. I haven't had a lot of time yet to process what I'm going to do on the websites. And how I'm going to do it. And there are now two of them. So that's even more confusing. Um, where there's going to be membership. I think on the one. HMR.co, still, um, I'm not sure if I've got that membership off right now. I need to put the app back on. So people are going to be able to join that site. For free. Membership. Also please subscribe to the newsletter. That's the site through which I'm going to run the groups. I just have to get it. All this logistically figured out. And then on the other site, adrianmaharicoaching.com, which I haven't blogged hardly on yet at all, it's a blog. And what I'm looking at doing is I'll be doing some public blogging, but I don't have the subscribe function up yet. But when I do, subscribe to the free membership of that site as well if you're interested, because there's going to be some blog posts. And again, it's not going to cost much, but they will be behind a paywall. So I will be doing public blogging and not public blogging, as well as video series and other things that are going to be at cost, but again, trying to keep it reasonable. So anybody that subscribes to either of those websites, ajmahari.co, ajmahari.com, whatever each website offers, when I make that more clear and get it structured, which better happen soon, then you can, by subscribing to the newsletter and, and subscribing to the free membership of the site, you will be offered discounts to anything that I am putting out there that is behind a paywall, if I can put it that way. And when I say paywall, don't panic. It's not like a lot of money. There are just reasons for doing that that don't even include that I need or want to make more money. <laughs> um, oh, um, yeah, where was I here? Yeah. And then Well, you know, I was just gonna say to um to Sugar Plum Enigma, this isn't a brand new chair, but I did get a new chair like this that's in my bedroom, um or living room, I mean, uh, a couple weeks ago. But I also got rid of all that weight in the medical problem, so yeah. I'm I'm, you know, more active, happy feeling much better everything's great and i don't know why that goes along with the chair but there you go um now where was i because i'm just watching the time here too um oh alpha dog no problem no worries don't worry about it at all you said you didn't mean to muddle the comment section not a problem people share with each other people get into discussions with each other that's great it's fine um angry driver um oh it's four in the morning for you wow okay magical time yes i think i think a lot of people are having sleep cycle issues oh you're gonna be starting a new job good um i don't know i'm in canada so y'all here i like that term 
we don't use that up here, but um, long story short, I had a relationship with somebody that lived in um, the U.S. many, many years ago. Um, and I don't think I was down there for about three days before I actually said to a few of them, I came out and I said, so y'all going up for lunch or what? And they just laughed hysterically. And I'm like, did I really just say that? <laughs> just differences in culture. So, um, and sometimes in these chats, we have a lot of Canadians, like Rav's in the same province I am and some other people sometimes, but I don't know where everybody's from tonight. And, um, oh, Angry Driver lives in Austria, Vienna. Cool. It's so neat how we can connect all around the world, isn't it? And I mean, I just have clients from almost everywhere that you can conceive of on earth and the time difference challenges, but we overcome those. Um, so since in German you call Vienna, when you also call a person from their, I don't know what that means. I mean, I know what it means in English, but um, so a real that and chat okay since i don't know how that's being used i'm just not saying it because <laughs> you never know um uh sugar plum enigma i haven't seen you in a while yeah i figured that by the fact you thought it was a new chair that's okay um cool that you're here um cargo thanks aj you're helping more people than you know well i hope so and thank you for that um alpha dog canada is so cool i miss going to vancouver yeah, well, um, Vancouver's way different than here, but yeah, it's a very cool place. I've had so many friends that have left Ontario for Vancouver, and I mean, we still keep in touch, you know, on the internet, but basically never look back. There was there was a few years there where like something like 15 or 20 people that I knew moved to, Van, uh, uh, you know, Vancouver, different areas. Maybe not Vancouver, but somewhere in BC, uh, different areas in British Columbia. And, um... Cargo, oh boy, I grew up saying y'all, and I'm in Florida, everyone. Yeah, what's up with that, y'all? Like, what, 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 how does that happen in Florida? I don't know. Um, and Nicole says, um, I'm in Chicago, and Al is in Chicago as well. Cool. And, oh, Lincoln Park. I've heard of that. I haven't been there, but yeah. I've been by Chicago a lot, and Chicago wouldn't even be a horrible trip from where I live, but I... You know, look at the world situation. But I just don't have a reason to go to Chicago. But, uh, so yeah, I think um, just really important to kind of, you know, summarize here that for people, you know, who, who have BPD even, a lot of what I said could help people. But if you've been with somebody, you know, you're the ex of a person with BPD or NPD, or like the adult child, like I said, or any other relationship type, it's important to ask yourself, no matter where you are in a process, unless you're already getting through that part or have gotten through that part, what are you holding on to and what do you need to let go of? And what are you maybe consciously aware of now that like car girl and I think CB alluded to that you're kind of in that not in action place between holding on to something and letting it go. And just to be clear, until we let something go, where it, some degree or other, it's holding on to something. And that is an inherent conflict in and of itself. That if you're holding on to something, whether, you're, you know, if you're aware of it especially, but if you're not yet aware of it, holding on to something versus what you need to let go and find out more about yourself and heal is going to produce a lot of internal conflict at the very least, as well as you might still be in conflict with someone else or somebody could be. Then the other thing is about that, that's where stress comes from. And that's, you know, what leads people to dis-ease and not always physical disease, but to be in a state of unease, to be stressed, right? And the implications of all of that. Because remember, we're living in a world today, not always to a degree, but now that is more stressful than ever. So people have to be really mindful of stress and how to effectively de-stress and, and bring that down and relax because there is the microcosm of people's stress and the macrocosm of stress that's affecting probably everyone in the world at one point or another to, at one point or another to one degree or another. 
And uh, Roller Girl, hey, I didn't even know you were here. You're awful quiet. <laughs> it's okay. From Las Vegas, yes. <clears throat> Alpha Dog, thanks for all the knowledge bombs, AJ. Oh, you're very welcome. So I just think it's really important for people to, like I said, you know, be in, be in a process, whatever it is that you need to be in or continue what you're doing to move from what you're holding on to. And if it's, if you're not sure yet, right, in some cases, to bring what you're holding on to from your conscious, I'm sorry, from your unconscious to your subconscious, right on up to your conscious mind, because that is the place from which there can be the seeds and seed of awareness that can help you with the, what you're holding on to, knowing it, and then the action steps towards letting it go. Because it's never as simple as, oh, I've been holding on to this, and now I'm letting it go. Because it, it's usually a process, and it usually involves grief. And that's where, again, it's important not to think pain is bad and the opposite is good. Because, you know, sometimes I just think, I think pain is one of the greatest teachers. And that doesn't mean we want to seek it out all day long. But um, just remember the silver lining, the silver cloud, and the gift of the pain in your healing journey as you go from holding on, holding it, holding on to it, sorry, to letting it go is a gift you're giving yourself and you and you alone deserve the credit you deserve to own that that's not because of a borderline or a narcissist parent or ex or anything that they gave to you maybe something just brought the winds of adversity to your conscious awareness okay but they don't get any um brownie points for that you own it you claim it you process it you feel it you move through it you stop holding on to it, you let it go, There's that's your gift. It's a gift you give yourself, as is forgiveness when people are ready to forgive because it's important not to put the forgiveness cart before the healing cart, right? Never mind the horse. There's no horse in that analogy. And DB, um, Vancouver is very cool. Um, hubs from interior um, BC. But we live close to Toronto. Thanks for your shares tonight, um, uh, Diver. Yes, good to connect. Um, with people, where people are at. Um, so you realize that you're not alone. That's cool. Yeah. So anyway, with that, I think um, it's a good time to go and um, to wrap up and to go. Because I don't want these streams to get too, too long. Uh, I want them to be, a you know, reasonable for people to listen back to or watch or whatever they do. Um, <clears throat> and car girl said, uh, wow, we we're at opposite ends or sides of the world. Um, super plum enigma. The hardest thing is forgiving yourself. Well, thank you for mentioning that because within all of what I've been talking about and these processes that people need to go through or are going through or wherever people are in their healing journeys, whatever that all means to each individual person. Definitely, there will be some self-forgiveness that's important as well. And not that things were your fault, but, it, but, but you know, if you did hurt somebody, that's, that's one place where people need self-forgiveness when they heal and stop doing what they've done that hurt others. But also when you feel the fear, the obligation, the guilt, or you're still holding on to somebody else's feelings, it's really important to forgive yourself and to not be hard on yourself about getting into a relationship that you couldn't know was going to be what it turned out to be. So painful, so abusive, so hurtful. And many people weren't aware that they have codependency and there's that process in people's lives to heal and keep growing through. And um, so, yeah, it's really important to, and maybe for a lot of people, the hardest thing is self-forgiveness, but I would say you're not ready to forgive anyone else until you can forgive yourself. Definitely. And I can certainly talk. See, these are some things I want to talk more about that aren't going to be just focused with, you know, on a borderline or a narcissist ex or parent, because there's so many moving pieces to this recovery for people and all kinds of recovery. So, and some of that might be coming in blogs and some of that might be coming in, like, I would like to call them probably mini courses, um, but things about excessive worry, things about fear, things about how to transition you know, um, between holding on to something 
coming more consciously aware and letting it go in that process. So there's only so much I can do in videos and audios and ebooks with worksheets um, versus the work I do with clients. But yeah, I'm going to have some stuff coming that aren't going to be titled just because you have, they're not going to be titled by label. They're going to be titled by the challenges, all the moving pieces of challenges that people need to deal with to heal the overall picture. So, and I'm going to try to break them down so people can kind of deal with one at a time. You know, like if you have excessive worry, do you have excessive fear? Is it anxiety? Well, you know, all kinds of the ego, I'm going to break it all down into a series of things like that. I just have to find the time to get it done. And, um, and Alpha Dog, he said, damn, that is well said. Well, if it was something I said, thank you. I'm not sure, but thank you if, if, if I'm right. And DB said, laugh out loud. We are just a stone's throw away. Oh, you're still talking about location. Okay. And Sugar Plum Enigma. Excellent. Thanks. I need to work with you because I've stalled. Oh, okay. Well, I look forward to that. Should you make that choice? And um, definitely I'm about helping people get unstuck, unblocked, uninstalled. You'd be amazed, you know, because I don't tell people what to do. You'd be amazed how much learning certain skills and tools and doing some work in, certain, in the ways that I do with people, that it starts unlocking things. And then people start to know more, learn more, and, you know, people gain autonomy through that. That's the goal. It's not, not me, you know, me just helping. Not me telling people what their truth or reality is or their way forward because people tend to know more inside than they think. But yeah, really helps to work with someone to get unstuck, unblocked, and to go into maybe, for a lot of people, it's heavy-duty emotional um, areas where it just helps to be supported, uh, validated, to have what you're doing, your transition, going from holding on to letting go witnessed and to be guided with that among other things anthony thank you for the podcast aj oh you're welcome you mean you've been here all this time and you were quiet too i know sometimes people are quiet and i didn't even look but oh yeah so certain various numbers of people here and um i'm afraid to say this but on some live streams the number have been higher than tonight and might grow higher so definitely don't want to complain about the people that are listening because I don't want to get to the point where the thing scrolls by so fast I can't keep up with anything. Um, I don't think it's a big worry on my channel, but I guess it could happen a little bit. You never know. Channel is like at 14,000 subscribers now. Half of them are asleep, but hey, it's growing, I suppose. Um, well, it's important to really, you know, yeah, GB, you need to, re, re, um, not refine, define more what it is that you need and then you'll be able to meet the need a little bit more effectively um oh i'm not sure what i need but i'm sure it's okay i don't know what the autocorrect uh, reference is there but anyway so with that everybody take care look forward to next time and um yes i think next live stream if i remember We'd like to talk more about what we lost in the last live stream about gut instinct, the gut brain, intuition, etc. So that's what I hope to do in the next live stream. And um, Carl AJ, half of them are asleep, laugh out loud. Well, yes. And um, Peasant Donut, what an interesting name. What if the BPD on YouTube won't get help and harasses everyone online? with their lies and won't stop. It's the most insane thing I've witnessed. Well, I guess when that happens, the best you can do is disengage, detach, don't pay attention, and, you know, don't hold on to it, let it go, and move forward. And I know, way easier said than done, but you don't have any control over it, right? And so it's painful, but it's important to get emotionally detached from it. And Seti, you're very welcome. I oh, you didn't know you were here. <laughs> um, I know there's more people here than have been um, participating, which is why you're participating when you're listening. I don't mean to say you're not. And Sugar Plum, Plum Enigma says to everyone, stay well. Yes. 
um, and up a dog ads to say stay safe and um, yeah angry driver it was an interesting stream so far um, one of the more interesting channels so far um, combos were interesting um, you're gonna sub well hey great and and welcome and you said any time for me to banish into thin air Oh, it's time for you to vanish into thin air, so take care. And you're very welcome, Peasant Donut. And, um, yes, Angry Driver. And, and you said lots there. And please don't feel like, because I didn't read it all, that it isn't important because other people will see it and read it. And you were talking to Alpha Dog, and I think that you, you know, your participation here is very valued and welcome along with everyone else. So I hope you know that. And DB, thank you so much, AJ, for all you give. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, good night, car girl and everyone. And so with that, I'm really going to stop talking now and say everybody take care. And good night.